So now what I'd like to do is introduce our presenter for tonight. Uh, he's been a presenter with us for decades now. He's a USATF level three presenter. It's Cameron Gary. He's a San Diego based uh, jump sprints and strength coach. He's coached athletes at the youth level, the high school level, D1 collegiate and elite levels. And he's now the head track and field coach at El Cajon Valley High School. As a competitor, Cameron was a high school and collegiate conference champion, school record holder, national championship, and the 1984 U.S. Olympic trials qualifier in the triple jump. He holds USA track and field uh, level three coaching certification in the jumps and a USA TF level two certification in the sprints, hurdles, and relays. And his topic tonight is an introduction to track and field biomechanics, really the most important part of coaching you're going to need this session. So at this point, it's my pleasure now to introduce our presenter for the evening, Coach Cameron Gary. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out and uh, or staying in or whatever the case may be. So you can uh, get a chance to hear what I have to say. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, from the very beginning that I, I can't really teach you anything. All I can do is just share. Um, I don't claim to be any real big uh, expert. Um, I have some experience. Um, I've had an opportunity to steal from a lot of coaches. Um, I, I think I just saw Sue Humphrey's name, uh, great high jump coach, and I, I've stolen some stuff from her, you know, and um, I, so there's a few other names I recognize as well. And so what I take is I steal from everybody and I put it all together and hopefully it makes some sense. So, so what, what I have, I, you know, I've, I've got from uh, Jim Kiefer, um, John Tansley, people like that who have given me lots of information and then I'm going to take that and kind of share it with you. Um, I am not a scientist. I am not a big biomechanics guy in that regard. I am just a coach. That's all I am. And I'm just going to try to do what I can to share what I know. And hopefully, um, you know, it'll make some sense to you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to share a PowerPoint that I have. Um, I normally do this in front of people. So this is going to be kind of weird for me too, but we're going to do our best. And hopefully you guys, um, I'll be as good as coach Andrea who preceded me. I know she was great. And hopefully I can, you know, somewhat measure up. So hopefully you guys can see my screen here and I'm gonna go ahead and get this, get us started. Okay, hopefully you guys can see it. So again, I am just a coach. So it's not about trying to be all fancy as far as our terminology, super geeky, anything like that. I'm all about trying to make complex things as simple as I possibly can. There's going to be a few points of the presentation that are going to be somewhat geeky, but in those, but those things, what we're going to do is we're going to do our best to try to simplify them. And I'm going to turn off my phone here, whatever. So anyway, it's making noise. So anyway, be that as it is, um, I'm going to do, do the best I can to help you guys out. And then uh, we're going to move on from there. So that's me. Tim already gave you my in information, USA track and field coach. Um, USA, USTF, Triple CA, hurdle specialist, relay sprints. I'm also a weightlifting coach as well. So, what's biomechanics? Well, first is body, you know, living organism, and mechanics are principles of movement. At which, and our main focus is not going to be more structure. Our, our focus is going to be on movement. How does the body move? Why does it move the way it does? And what kind of effects can we have on the body to make it move a particular way? So we're going to start off with planes of the body. You hear people talk a lot about different planes, frontal, sagittal, transverse. What does all that stuff mean? So let's kind of take things and make it real simple. Let's start with the frontal plane. On a frontal plane, we're going to divide the body to front and back sides. So we're going to basically imagine if you took like an axis or, or a stick, you stuck it in your belly, and then you rotated somebody. That's the way we would rotate. So front and back side shifts left and right. That's our frontal plane, all right? So now sagittal plane, it's if I took the same stick and I ran it through my hips and divides us from left to right. So it moves forward and backward. So a good way to think of that is a sit up. That's moving through the sagittal plane because we're going up and down, forward and backwards in, in that particular direction. And then last but not least is what we call the transverse or some people will call the horizontal plane. So that basically divides the body in between upper and lower halves. So we're going to take that same stick and we're going to run it right down through our head, down through the middle of our body. And that's what's twist us left and right. So if you want to think of a transverse plane, think of a, a skater that spins, you know, they're spinning 
along a transverse plane because they're turning around in a circle, basically. So that's a basic planes of the body. Now, what's energy? People talk about energy a lot. So let's talk about energy. It's basically strength and vitality. How do we sustain physical or, or, or mental activity? So we can hear energy. Like right now, you're hearing sound energy. We can see energy. Hopefully your computer is working. So you've got some light that is giving you an image. And you can also feel energy, kind of like wind, for instance. Um, you hear you know, like the energy when, it's, when the wind is blowing, the air is blowing. So force. Another thing we hear people say a lot, a technical term, how fast can you move one kilogram of mass? Well, Newton's second law. We're going to get to Newton a little bit later. Layman's, how hard you can push and pull stuff. And that's kind of a hard concept these days because kids don't grow up the way I did. You know, 60 year old man, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Things are much different. We played different types of games. We did all kinds of outdoor stuff. But um, kids these days don't have the same concept. So when you tell kids to apply force, a lot of times they don't know what it means. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see where it says Malik's story. Well, Malik is my son. I'll give you, I'll tell you a little story. I used to tell my son all the time, hey, you know, when you get, when you get ready to run a race, you know, push hard or apply force into the ground. He had no idea what I was talking about. So when he was about 12 or 13, we used to go to the weight room and we'd go out and we'd do squats. So I'd put a bar on his back and I'd say, okay, so take it off the rack. And I'd put, you know, obviously I put rails underneath him so he didn't get hurt. And I would say, okay, son, go and pick it up. And he'd put, I gave him about a hundred pounds, pick up the hundred pounds. His eyes got big as the bottom of a Coke bottle. He's like, oh my God, this is really heavy. I says, okay, now lift it. <laughs> and so, and he, and, he, and he was able to do it. So I wasn't going to put him in danger, obviously. And so, and so you feel that how you have to push into the ground, that's applying force. And so when he understood that, you know, the light kind of went on in his head and the very next year he was the fastest kid in the school. So, so he understood force. So sometimes with kids, particularly nowadays, you almost have to put them in position where they have no choice but to exert force. So, so it's, it's, you can't see it. You can see movement, but you really can't see force. So you almost have to make a kid feel it in order for it to make sense to them. So let's talk muscular articulation. It's a fancy word. I know it is. But it, all it just basically means is how do we move something around a particular anatomical position? Usually it's around a joint. So when we talk about flexion, we hear that term a lot, dorsiflex or, you know, uh, whatever kind of flexion or hip flex or whatever. And all it simply means is that you're decreasing the joint angle. You're bringing something from one point to another. You're bringing it closer in usually. And um, so that's, that's a decreasing joint angle. An extension, it's just the opposite. Think of a leg extension when you're doing, a, when you're sitting on the, on the leg extension machine. And I know some of you guys won't admit it, but you've done it before your leg extension machine uh, in the gym or a hyper extension. It's basically when you take something beyond its normal extension position. Oftentimes that, in, that entails injury, but that's what hyper extension is. Abduction, AB, as opposed to adduction, ADD. Abduction is moving away from the body's midline. Adduction is moving toward. Easiest way to remember the two, ADD, like A, David, David, ADD. Think of like ad, you know, accumulation, bringing things together. So if you remember add, that means you're going to bring the joints in towards the body. That's your adduction as opposed to abduction, B as in Betty, moving away from the body's midline. Monoarticular or monoarticular, when you move around one joint. Good example, biceps curl, moving around the elbow joint. Biarticular, moving around two joints. A good compound movement would be like a hamstring, um, hamstring movement. You know, because usually the hamstrings are going to work around your hips as well as your knees. Um, one of the exercises I no longer do, well, at least to a great extent, is the old fashioned um, laying on a, on a bench hamstring curl. Not saying it's not a good exercise because it, it, it is, but a regular hamstring curl, sometimes it's a little bit too much, um, too, too monoarticular when I want to just work the hamstrings on around both joints if, if I possibly can. I'm not saying you can't do Nordics because Nordics are a whole nother, whole nother ball of wax, but um, that's just an, just one explanation. Another special articulation is a dorsiflexion. That's, we hear that term a lot in track and field. Simple way to think about that for dorsiflexion is to simply bring the toes up towards your knees. So you're elevating the foot by flexing the ankle. So the toes are coming upward. Plantar flexion, another term you'll hear, simple. Point your toes, real simple. 
So let's talk about mass. A lot of times we'll talk about mass. Mass is nothing more than how much matter accumulates in an object. Real simple. Um, a lot of times we make it really complex, but it really isn't. It's how much stuff is in there. How much stuff is in the box? How much stuff is in the bottle? How much stuff is in the body? That's your mass. Your mass doesn't change, and it's, and it's very different from weight, and we're going to talk about weight in a minute. Center of mass, which we hear that a lot, is the point in an object. It could be a human body. It could be an implement like a javelin or a, or a shot where, this, where it's perfectly balanced, so where your center of acceleration is located. I say center of acceleration for a reason, because if you throw a, a um, shot, you're going to want to push that shot, that ball, through its center, not along its side, because it'll be, <coughs> excuse me, it'll, then it'll go kind of um, in an opposite, uh, in, into a weird direction, basically, for lack of a better term, because you're not efficiently pushing it through its best possible point, and that's its center of acceleration. So remember, in a human being, as you can see in this drawing here, a person's center of mass is not necessarily fixed. So it could be anywhere relative to how your body's arranged. So um, for some of our um, high jump people, you know, um, now that we teach the, the flop technique, um, we have the body kind of bend backwards a little bit, which will arrange our center of mass somewhat outside the body. There's a lot more to high jumping than simply wrapping around the bar. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we work our way through it. But that's one area where we can, we can work on our center of mass. So remember the center of mass doesn't always have to be within the body. So here's a classic example. Here's a donut. Some of you have seen donuts before. I've seen several. And looking at a donut, we see it. Okay, it's got a hole in the middle. Where is its center of mass? Well, its center of mass, if you sit in that particular configuration, is in that airspace there. So is that still part of the donut? Absolutely. Is it in space? Absolutely. But it's still its center of mass. And it could be the same for a human body. So remember, the center of mass does not always have to be within the body. I'm going to show you a little trick, or it's not really a trick, it's just an example of where your center of mass can be outside your base of support. Um, I had my wife do a little uh, demonstration a few years ago, and I put her up against the wall. Um, it was voluntary, so just so you know. And she did a little thing where we would bend over and um, see if you could fall and that sort of thing. And I'm going to show it to you. Now you see her bend forward, and as she moves, you see her hips cannot go to the rear. So her base, her base of support, where her center of mass, you can see it kind of fell outside of her base of support. So because of her, I don't, hopefully you guys can see this, my finger here, but her center of mass, as it begins to move, what happens, the body will have to fall. It has no choice because the base of support is over her feet. So, or, it, or is her feet. So right now her center of mass is over her feet. She can balance herself just fine, but because the wall is here, her hips cannot move. Center of mass must move forward. She must fall. But if she steps away from the wall, as you can see here, now when she bends forward, her, her rear has to move towards the wall. As you'll see here, her center of mass stays over her base of support, and now she can bend over and touch her feet. Well, what does that have to do with track? Well, think about, again, the high jump. Think about the hurdles. Think about sprint starts. Think about the long jump, landing, all that sort of thing, where the center of mass may or may not be within the body. And part of track and field, in terms of using our body, is to learn how to manage where our center of mass is relative to, you know, if, if we're hitting an object, if we're throwing an object, if we're trying to clear an object, if we're trying to move our body, you know, away from an object, like jumping off the board or something along those lines. My wife will love that I showed you guys this, by the way. So anyway, what is weight? Okay, we hear about weight a lot. Weight and mass are not the same. Weight is how much gravitational pull there is on an object. So it could be, you know, an object with a lot of mass. So for instance, on the earth, gravity pulls our mass towards the earth at about 32 feet or 9.81 meters per second squared. So just think of it like this. Your mass is what it is on the earth. But if you go to the moon, 
The moon's about one-seventh the size of the Earth. So the moon has about one-seventh the gravitational pull of the Earth. And so consequently, you're going to weigh about one-seventh of what you do here on the Earth. But your mass has not changed. So that's when you see like those old space movies when those guys are, you know, Apollo, I was like 10 years old, you know, when they landed on the moon and the guys are jumping around. That's because they only weighed like 30 pounds or whatever. It's, it, it felt very different because there wasn't as much gravity pulling them down. They did not weigh as much. However, their mass is unchanged. Now, keep in mind, your density of mass will influence your weight. So if I have a one foot or one cubic foot block of something, like styrofoam versus a cubic foot of iron, they're gonna be very, very different in terms of how much they weigh. Because the density of iron is gonna be quite a bit more than the density of styrofoam. So let's talk levers. Levers, okay, what are levers? Well, levers are anytime you take a bar of some sort and you rotate it about an axis, which is called a fulcrum. Okay, so for objects in space, that fulcrum, if you will, can be the body's center of mass because we're gonna generally rotate in space around our center of mass. And I'm gonna show you a little, I wouldn't call it a trick, but a demonstration a little bit later in terms of how that works. So any type of force that you use to cause movement against resistance is what we call a motive force. So for us, it's usually our muscles, but there could be other things. There could be you know um, leverage of an, of an object or whatever against us, for instance. Um, resistive force, is opposition to that motive force. It could be weight, it could be obstacles, it could be friction, it could be whatever, hurdles, whatever. So moving back through leverage again, there's many classes, well, three main ones. So first class, one we most commonly, that we're most commonly associated with uh, seesaw or scissors. So you have the axis that's gonna be between the force and the resistance, all right? And then you have, um, a muscular example will be a triceps extension. Second class lever is where the resistance is between the axis and the force. So if you ever use a wheelbarrow or a nutcracker or whatever, that's a um, second class lever. There aren't that many examples of that in human bodies. So on um, calf raises, you know, moving around the, around the ankle for the calf raise, that's an example. The most common that we have in the human body is what we call a third class lever. That's where the force is between, is between the axis and the resistance. So if you take a, uh, like a shovel or a baseball bat or a golf swing, you're going to have the force that's between the axis and the resistance. So most of the body's you know, levers are that. So if you take, for instance, a biceps curl, you have your, so you have weight in your hand. And so your biceps, um, the tendon is going to pull, but that where it's pulling is actually in front of your elbow. And so it has to exert a great deal of force to move even a small resistance. The upside of that, of, of course, is that um, you can move very, very fast that way. So that's why people with uh, long arms are better at the discus throw than people with short arms. They are able to, to exert a lot more um, leverage in that regard. And we'll get more into that a little bit later. Okay, let's talk about displacement. Displacement, we hear about that a lot. My displacement wasn't good or I, did, I didn't displace well out of the blocks. Displacement is simply a change in an object's position. It's the shortest distance between the starting and end point. That's our displacement. Velocity is displacement in a particular direction. Now, normally we're gonna express that as a unit of time versus length. So we think of meters per second often in track or sometimes degrees per second or miles per hour or something like that along those lines. Acceleration is the rate of change in an object's displacement displacement. It's very different from speed, and we're going to talk about speed in a minute. But acceleration can actually decrease while your velocity increases. I'll give an example. In a sprint race, I ask this question all the time with my athletes, and I would ask you if we were inside of a classroom now, when is your greatest rate of acceleration? A lot of times folks say, well, 20 meters or 10 meters or something along those lines. But see, they're thinking speed acceleration is the rate of change. So let's just say for a, a good, you know, high school age sprinter, they can go from zero to about four or five meters per second in one step. And so their rate of change on that very first step is five meters per second. 
So that second step, they're not going to go from five to 10 meters per second, or otherwise they're, they're, they should be out getting paid, making some money because no one ac accelerates like that. So they're probably going to go from five meters per second to maybe, maybe seven or eight or something like that, their second step. I, I have it written down somewhere. So now even though they're going faster, even though their speed and their velocity is increasing, their acceleration or the rate of change has actually gone down. So don't confuse acceleration with speed. It's not necessarily the same. So acceleration is how much your rate of change, you know, is in terms of your displacement. So while we're talking about speed, let's talk about speed. Speed is the magnitude, basically how fast something moves. Magnitude, how much velocity we have. Doesn't matter what direction. Again, speed is not the same as acceleration. The perception of speed, keep in mind, is relative to an object's position. So if you and I are standing next to an elevator, hopefully you'll never be doing that, but if you're standing next to an elevator that's moving, you can perceive that elevator moving up and down. Maybe you're in a building with, what the, with those exposed glass towers, you know, or maybe if you're at um, in Chicago and you go in what we used to call the Sears Tower, it's called I think, the Willis Building or something now where those elevators are moving, you know, like 60 or 80 miles an hour. You can't perceive that when you're on the elevator, because as you can see on this example on the right, that person and that apple are moving with the elevator, whether it's going up or going down. So you don't perceive any movement at all. You know, that's why I really enjoy watching those um, movies on TV where the person's on a train or a car or whatever, and they're running or, they're, or the car's driving next to the other car and they're gonna jump across to get on the other car because they perceive that the other car is moving the same speed that, that they are. In theory, that is, that is possible, but there's a little thing that we call wind and air that's gonna kind of mess that up. So, so as you jump off, the, you, know, you gotta overcome that friction of the air and um, you're probably not gonna make it to that next car that's next to you. So I'm not saying it isn't possible. I'm just saying that it's highly improbable. Momentum, momentum. Not the same as less momentum. No, just kidding. Momentum. It's a product of mass and velocity. So remember that momentum has direction and magnitude. It means it's going somewhere and it has amount of something. So when, when momentum is built up in a system, you know, we can transfer that momentum by stopping a part of that system. So one of the biggest things that we work on with our throwers, for instance, or our throws coaches out there, is learning how to block. And um, some of you, all of you throws coaches know what I'm talking about. So as I'm, if I'm throwing a shot, you see this person right here, when they get ready to throw the shot with this arm, they're gonna stop this side of their body by doing what we call a block. I'm not gonna get into the technique of that right now, but by stopping that part of the body, it's gonna transfer momentum into the other part of the body. Well, what does that mean? Well, again, think of again, like throwing an implement or tripping over something. Or as you, as you walk, you stub your toe, your upper body keeps moving. It becomes like a hinge moment, but that's also another transfer of momentum. Here's another example. Think about a car, okay? Car's driving 60 miles an hour. Newton's first law here. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion or at rest unless act upon by a net force. So here's our car. We're rolling along at 60 miles an hour. And so you're in the car as well. Then you have a concrete block and you hit that concrete block. Hopefully you've got your seatbelt on. So if you don't have a seatbelt on, that car is gonna stop. If you're not restrained, it's gonna transfer that momentum of that car moving to you. And so the way the seatbelts work, believe it or not, is not really to stop you, it's to actually slow you down. And so that's what they tell you. If you have a uh, car accident and, you, and, you're and you're restraining your car, or if you have a motorcycle accident and you, and you, and you hit your head on the ground and you're wearing a helmet, hopefully, um, what, that helmet's designed to, to basically crush the, 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 the foam material inside to slow your head down. The seatbelt's designed to stretch and give a little bit to slow you down rather than stopping you immediately, which would potentially save your life. And so that's how that works. So if you don't wear a seatbelt, boom, out you go. And that, that, that would not end well. And I'm just as a little aside, I, I come from a background in law enforcement and I've seen you know, people in, in accidents that did not survive 
accents that would have been otherwise easily survivable if they would just simply adhere to this simple concept of wearing a safety belt. So please, particularly young people, wear safety belts all the time. You can't go against Newton's first law. Okay, here's an example of momentum transfer. Let's go and watch Sandra Perkovich, one of my favorite discus throwers. I love the discus. Even though I'm a jumps coach, I, I'm, a, I'm a closet thrower. So I'm just always just too small, but I love the throws. So see if you can watch, watch how she moves and watch her body and what she does. And you're going to see her develop some energy here. You're going to see her spin around really fast. You're going to see some, some rotational speed. And let's go back a little bit. Watch her, watch her left arm and watch her leg, how it stops. Boom. You see how she stopped right here and her arm stopped as well? And then what that does, that transfers energy because she stopped her left side of her body. The right side kept going and it sped up even faster. And that's how we get going. And of course, the, uh, you got to have the celebration. The celebration makes the discus go farther the more you celebrate. So, so that's a good example of momentum transfer. Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. Net forces causes objects to accelerate. So it's a magnitude thing again. Larger forces potentially create more acceleration. Stronger you are, helps you start well. It's inversely proportional to your mass. Less force to accelerate a smaller object than a larger one. Fat doesn't fly. And even muscle must be moved. So you got to remember, this is a weight sport. I tell kids this all the time, and parents even. You'd be surprised how much it takes now, how little it takes actually to stop stop a person. I, I saw something about horse racing where they where they have these horses that weigh about uh, 1,500, 1,800 pounds. It takes as little as five pounds to slow a large horse, a, a race horse, a full length. So, so you'd be surprised how much that matters. So keeping your body fat down, you know, keeping your weight down while keeping your strength high is going to be a, a great benefit. Third law. Every action equal an opposite reaction. Object A hits object B. It exerts a force on object B, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. Like TV shotgun blast, when they shoot the gun, the person flies away. That's not real. All right, because if you flew away in one direction, the person shooting would fly away in the other direction. Doesn't happen. But right here, we look at Newton's cradle. You see some transfer momentum. The one ball is hitting, transferred out the other side. When you hit in one direction, you're going to push away in the other direction. Where does that matter? Sprinting, throwing, um, particularly in the blocks. I'm going to show you a pretty good video here um, that I have of my kids doing some stuff. And I'm going to show you a video of Christian Coleman doing a start. So my, I, show, I have a little get with my kids. I tell them, if you get on this little twisting, turning, little turntable I have, and if you can move your arms and your knees in the same direction, then I'll give you 100 bucks. I have yet to lose this bet. And they all think they can do it. But they try it, and it's really funny because, you know, and these are pretty good athletes. The kid that's on the turntable right there, he's, a, he's a, like a 26-foot long jumper, and he's trying his best to get it, but, but you can't do it. Well, why is that? Because, again, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the harder he tries to push his knees or his, and his feet in one direction, his arms are going to have to go in the other direction. And believe me, they always try it. They think they can do it, and I, we get a good laugh on it every year. But they try their best, and and they and they're all convinced they can do it. But as you can see, they can't. So think about that when, in terms of putting together some of your movements for your athletes, in your field events, in your running events, in your throws, all that matters. You know, in your jumps, all that matters. So when teaching movement in the air for like the long jump, for instance, the hitch kick, you know, we're doing that specifically because of this. Because we're, we're trying to impart a, a, a movement on one part of the body to get a reaction on another. Because remember, the center of mass can al also exist in the air or while your body's in space. So it doesn't, doesn't matter if you're in the air or not. And you can see she's trying it here. And she's not going to do it either. So here's Christian Coleman. Here's why he starts so well. Here are the blocks. Think of the blocks 
as being a um, as if as being a floor. That's what I tell my athletes. Think of the blocks as being the floor. So you see this front block here. The harder he pushes on that front block in one direction, his, his legs are going to go the other. I mean, his body hips are going to go the other. You see his second foot? This is the hardest step in sprinting, by the way, is that second step. Comes through, hits. The harder he pushes in one direction, his hips go in the other. What most people cannot do is that particular movement for those first three steps. It looks simple. It's very difficult to do. One of the reasons why is because most people are afraid of falling. And so they put that foot out in front of them to stop that, you know, themselves from falling. But because they do, remember, every action has equal and opposite reaction. So if you put your foot down here to stop yourself from falling, now you're pushing into the ground, which means your body has to pop up. That's why we see weaker athletes, you know, don't, who don't have enough strength or, or who are newer or whatever, why they pop up at the start. So all the start drills where you have them bend over at the hips, it's a waste of time. They have to learn how to push to the rear. The harder you can push to the rear and recover the leg straight ahead and push again to the rear, the faster and more efficiently you're going to move forward. Summations of force. Okay, proximal distal. Proximal, close to the body. Distal away from the body. Um, the proximal joints tend to be a little more heavily muscled. Distal joints, not quite as heavily muscled. So think of like your pecs and all those muscles around your chest. So they're really strong, but they don't really, you can't really flex your pecs really quickly. But your fingers are not quite as strong, but those fingers, you can move them very fast. So for playing the piano or, 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 or moving drumsticks or, or something along those lines. So we got to remember proximal muscles. Stronger, slower, distal muscles and joints, that is, move faster. Shot put strike. A lot of people don't realize this, but the shot put is actually thrown off the fingers. So it isn't simply just hitting and pushing the ball. If you push the ball off your palm, that's not as efficient as pushing the ball from your hand, off the base of your fingers, off your fingertips. And there's a technique to that. Our throws coaches out there, I'm sure, already know that. Firing orders, kind of about the same lines that we just talked about, proximal, distal. Keep in mind that the athletics track and field is an athletic discipline. It is not a robotic discipline. So our firing orders are not consecutive, meaning there is no one thing that ends discreetly and then the next thing happens and the next thing happens. Those things tend to overlap. And because they overlap, those overlapping movements become smoother and now we have more coordination. But remember, the slower, stronger muscles tend to move first. That's usually with voluntary movements, though. Reflex actions are a little bit different. So certain things we do, and we try to train it, like the stretch reflex and things like that with plyometric jumping, rebound jumping, that sort of thing. A good example of a, of, of a, of a spinal reflex would be burning your hand on a, on a hot oven or something. So when you put your hand on the oven, you don't sit there and think about, hey, man, that, mm, what's that smell? That's my, that's, oh, those are my fingers cooking. No, you feel that. It goes to your central nervous system before going all the way to your brain, and it tells you pick up your hand before you burn yourself. That's a reflex action. Okay, we're going to get just a little geeky just for a couple of minutes. I'm going to ask you to bear with me here. Open chain and closed chain. I'm going to, you know, I, I wrote a lot of stuff here, but I'm just going to keep it real simple. Open chain, distal end is moving free in the air. Closed chain, distal end is locked uh, against something. So I'll give you a good example. Swing phase in sprinting is when your, your legs are moving in the air. That's an open chain movement. Stance phase, when your feet are on the ground, that's more of a, that, that's a closed chain, all right? So when we train, we have to train relative to what we're trying to, to enhance. Sometimes people will say that um, closed chain is more um, sports specific or whatever, or more functional. And that's, that may be true, but remember, open chain isn't always not functional. You just have to understand what it is. And so you have to train that according to what we're trying to accomplish. So you can't do enough closed chain movements to match the speed of certain open chain movements. So you have to move fast in order to re-engage your body in that way and to train that particular movement. So a movement like a squat or a lunge is great for building strength. And, and frankly, all your weightlifting for sprinters is to enable you to get out of the blocks and make about those first five or six steps. But once you get going about 20 meters, you, you, your, your squats aren't gonna help you that much. You cannot 
squat fast enough to match that movement. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, I mentioned hamstring engagement for a reason here because hamstrings are kind of a combination. Hamstrings, remember, work better for running if you use it as a hip extensor as opposed to simply a knee flexor. So back to that flexion thing, knee flexor, bending the knee. If, you, if, you're, if you're laying on bending the knee a lot, the problem is your hamstrings are going to be in a weakened position, and that may put you in a position to get hurt. So we want to use the biggest muscle in the body, which is the glute, and we want to use that to help extend the leg and our, use our hamstrings on the bottom end, that is, and our, to, to flex to, to help that. Remember, proximal, glute, distal, down near the calf. So we start from there and we work our way out. The way I like to classify it with my athletes is uh, the, the, the butt or your buttocks, your hips, that, that's our engine. Our legs are our suspension and our feet are our tires. So we gotta have all, all of them to drive a car, but if you've got no engine, you're not going anywhere. You, you can drive on your rims though if you want, but it won't work well, but it, you, you can still go forward. Moment arm, long moment arms, short moment arms. Think of it like unscrewing a nut from a bolt. The longer the moment arm, the more load you can apply to a joint axis. So what does that mean? Well, take a, like take a nut that you're trying to unscrew from a bolt. So if you use your hand, you can, you can exert some force on it, but it's not going to be quite as strong as taking a, monkey, a, a crescent wrench and trying to open it. Or if, or if it's a really tight bolt, you, what do you do? You go get the big wrench that's you know in, in outside in the garage, a big monkey wrench, and get a very long axis on it because you can apply more torque on it and get that um, and get that that rusty nut to move. So how does that matter? Well, when we think about twisting forces and rotating systems, we're going to go back to Coach Isaac Newton again, and we look at a rotating system, and then we have inertia again. We're trying to overcome. So we're going to take angular inertia and we're going to take that long moment arm and we're going to try to twist and make a twisting force around that axis. So that's going to always apply anytime that you're twisting. Always. Longer lever arm, more torque. So let's look at an event where we talk about um, twisting. The hammer throw is a great example. Discus throw, great example. Um, if I'm looking for a thrower's, if I've got a, you know, a big buff person with big old chest and a lot of big muscles, you know, and they can bench press a ton of weight, then yeah, that person's got probably going to be a pretty good shot putter if they have good coordination and some good speed. But, if, but for the discus throw, I want somebody that's got knuckles that are dragging on the ground. So that's, I, want, I want super long arms that they can really extend out and give me some long, you know, long angular velocity. So for instance, if they're farther from the axis, then we're going to talk about angular versus curve linear. Now, angular velocity, as I spin around an axis, it's going to go a certain number of degrees per second. Okay? Doesn't matter where along that, that line it is. So as that person's spinning around, you know, that's going to go a certain amount of, you know, it's going to take a certain amount of time to get from one point to another point or a certain number of degrees. Think of a golf swing, all right, or swinging a hammer. However, the ball on the hammer is moving really, really fast, even though the person is not moving that fast in the middle. Think of a figure skater, same thing. Arms extended, they slow down. Arms brought into the body, they speed up. Um, if, you, um, if I have a long arm, let's say if I have a short arm like a little kid and I try to slap you, it'll hurt a little bit. But if I have Shaquille O'Neal with a seven-foot arm and I have the same amount of velocity, that long arm is going gonna, is gonna to really hurt when it gets to you. Um, if you look at pro golfers, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wannabe golfer. And um, as a wannabe golfer, I have a, um, you know, I'm trying to work on improving my golf speed. But we know that pro golfers can move that, that club at about 120 miles an hour. But how fast do the hands move? About 20. So what they're doing is they're trying to increase the curve linear velocity at the end of that, the end of that axis or at the distal end to make that club move fast. Here's a great example right here. Here's an American record holder in a disc doing a drill where she's throwing a weight and she's working on trying to get her body extended. Look at her left arm, how it pulls back in, blocks her left shoulder. She stops her leg. I think she reverses now, but let's look at it again. Turns, tries to get her, tries to get that ball 
as far from her spine as possible. So we want that arm as, as extended as possible, perpendicular as possible, as you can see. And as she turns, she stops her body right here. You see her leg plant, you see her shoulder and arm block, yet this arm continues to move. And you see she's almost exactly perpendicular as far as that weight right here relative to her body. Her arm is almost exactly perpendicular relative to her, to her body. So the longer we can make that arm, the more velocity or the longer that, or the more torque we can develop and the farther we can throw the, the instrument. Yeah, it's transfer momentum as well, as you can see. Hinge moment, okay, hinge moment. Real simple, it's a trip, really simple. So you keep moving down the runway or you wherever you're moving, as you continue to move, the system is gonna stop right here at the board. As you stop, this part's gonna rotate over. That's what we call a hinge moment. The mode of energy that was used to move that body down the runway doesn't go away. Basically, it transfers from here upward out the head and makes the body rotate over. Come to the long jump class, we'll explain how to control that. But we have to have a hinge moment or you cannot jump. Actually, you can't even sprint either because you're gonna have your foot that's going to hit out in front of you. Now, not as much as, as a jumper, obviously, but it will hit out in front of you. Otherwise, your body wouldn't, would not go up. So it has to be a series of controlled trips, for lack of a better term. So high jumps. This is for Sue Humphrey. I know she's a high jump, great high jump coach. And um, you want to coach a high jump? I'm going to bless all of you here right now. You're going to be honorary high jump coaches. You know, I'm not even going to charge you for this. But if you want to understand the high jump, you watch this video. Um, this, I got this from my coach, um, who was my coach in college. He's Yukita Maraki. He's over in Japan. And he sent me this a, a few years ago. And if you understand this regarding rotating systems, uh, hinge moments, curve linear velocity, you know, summations of force, all that, now you can coach a high jump. Take a look. You're going to see the jumper stepping home here, come up, and he's going to plant, and you're going to see him jump, okay? Well, we've seen high jump before, Coach, so what big deal? What is that all about, okay? So just kind of look closely. Now, I see right here, Yukito has a cut-down crossbar. It has got a weighted top on it, and it's got a spring in it as well. And so what he's going to do, he's going to throw that bar down into the ground. It's going to bounce up. You can do this with a pencil as well, any pencil with an eraser, but you can do the same thing. You see it come over, and you're going to see that transfer of momentum. When it hits, he's hitting, boom, hinge moment, as you can see. So when the athlete runs up, he's moving. Everything's moving at the same rate of speed, and you're going to see him stop, boom, right there at the bottom. Same as that, you know, as you saw on the stick. So from here, oh, it looks like I, I, I scooted back a little bit. Let me move up a little bit. Okay, then from here, he's going to pop over. You're going to see the, the, the object because it stopped. Remember, we talked about how out the distal end, this was the distal end. The energy doesn't go away. It rotates and it speeds up the other side. And so now the uh, object will then spin over or basically topple over, basically making a somersault movement. Oops, didn't mean to do that either. Let me go back. Bear with me, bear with me guys. I accidentally popped forward. So you'll see right here, his body is the same as that stick. So as he comes up, pops over, body rotates. Now, there will be a certain amount of back bending and all that sort of thing. And you're going to need that to clear the bar, obviously. But what I see sometimes athletes do, they spend a lot of time with doing, frankly, excessive amounts of back bending. But if you go back and look at the, the, the gentleman from Cuba that has the world record, Sotomayor, and you watch him when he high jumps, he doesn't have an excessive amount of, or high jumps, he doesn't have an excessive amount of back bend. But what he does do, is rotate around the bar. And he and obviously he jumps very high. If you jump eight feet, you, you're jumping pretty high. So, but you see a lot of rotation. There's he has enough back bend, 
but he must rotate around the bar. And then there, of course, there's, you know, center of mass. And as he drops his butt, remember every action equal and opposite reaction. As the butt drops, the head goes up. Remember, the head goes up. Where must the feet go? The feet must go in the opposite direction. So once you clear the bar, butt drops down, head goes up, feet must go up, the body will clear the bar. So once you understand that, if you understand those basic concepts, you can teach the flop high jump. It's really that just that simple. Well, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that, but that's those are the basic concepts. So I hope that made some sense. So, so anyway, guys, um, I appreciate you guys being here. At the end of the day, regardless of what we do or how we coach or what we teach, we still must be functional. So you can lift all the weight in the world, but if you can't roll over a zip tie, it doesn't matter. So don't be a pallet jack. So do your best to give people things that they can use or things that are worthwhile, things that are functional and things that make sense, things that make physical sense. And once you do that, I think you have an opportunity to be successful. So moving right along, I want to thank the people that gave me some inspiration for what I'm doing. I talked about Jim Kiefer earlier and um, John Tansley as well. And um, I, I, I borrowed a lot, frankly, stole a lot um, earlier. Um, Doug Todd and we were all talking about um, Tom Ecker. I read his book, read, read his book. If you don't have it, get Tom Ecker's book, you know, uh, about track and field uh, biomechanics or I think it's track and field dynamics, something like that, but look him up, get his book. It'll help you. I guarantee it. Um, thanks again for all you guys being here. That's my info. If you email me, if you have any questions at all, I know we're going to ask, answer and ask questions here now. Uh, I'll be happy to answer whatever questions you guys have. Um, I do answer all my emails. You can follow me on Instagram or hit me up on Facebook or whatever, whatever you want. And, um, I, but I do answer all my emails and I'll be happy to um, explain whatever I can and share whatever I have. And, um, you know, thank you guys again. I know I can't see you, but I feel the love anyway. And I appreciate you guys being here. So I guess we're going to open up for questions now. Yes, we are, Cameron. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, one quick reminder, everybody, we are going to post this video online because that was an awful lot of stuff. It's great. And it's really, if you can go through it individually and look at different sections and really play around with it, you'll really start to understand it here. So Cameron, a uh, couple questions here that came up. Uh, this is probably the best one so far. Uh, how much of this do you share with the athletes about biomechanics? And if you do share it, how do you share it with them? Well, as far as sharing with athletes, I share everything with the athletes. However, I have to put it in a, in a frame that they can understand, you know? So, so I'll tell a kid, like, for instance, every action equal and opposite reaction. So, for instance, starting blocks. Okay, so I'll tell a kid, okay, well, I'm not going to explain Newton's law and all that kind of stuff because they kind of heard, heard it. They kind of understand it. But if I tell them, okay, when you walk upstairs, when you walk upstairs, which way do you push? Well, I push down. Why do you push down? Well, because I want to go up. Boom, there you go. Now you understand Newton's law about every action equal and opposite reaction. So if you push down to go up, so now we're going to take those stairs and we're going to tilt them at a 45 degree angle and that's your sprint start. So if you understand that, now you can push. And that's, a, that's how I explain it. That's great because when Andrea does her block session next Wednesday, a week from tomorrow, if you understand that going in, that could be very helpful. Uh, here's the next question here. Is the center of mass the same as the center of acceleration? I just didn't quite get it, it says. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. It is absolutely the same. And that's why it's important that we understand that your center of mass is that point where, where, you're, where you can most reasonably affect a person. You probably can't see me here. Or I don't know if you can or not, but where you can okay. most well affect a person's body. You know, So, for instance, if I want to move, of my center of acceleration or my head, well, my head's not going to be my center of acceleration, but if I let my head drop or whatever, when I'm trying to push, my center of acceleration is at my hips. And so now if I'm pushing eccentrically, it's not going to be as efficient. So we want to try to push the, as close center of mass as possible. So when I tell kids is when we're pushing down the track, push the hips down the track. I think that's the easy way for kids to understand it because the hips Although aren't exactly your center of mass, they're close enough. But the old days where we used to have guys run underneath things and, 
you know, all we had then was people bending over, you know, and they weren't running and they were, they were pushing in the wrong place and they were running bent over. And they wondered why their starts didn't get any better. Well, because you're pushing the wrong way and you're pushing the wrong thing. So if you work on pushing your hips down the track, which is close to your center of mass, that's going to be a better center of acceleration than trying to bend your head over and putting yourself off balance and not pushing your center of acceleration. So I hope that makes better sense for you. This question popped up right then. How do I get one of those? I don't think they mean, <laughs> I, I, do they mean you coach, uh, Coach Gary, or do they mean the, the biomechanic doll thing? Well, the biomechanic doll is on sale for $49.99 at my you know website. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> At two for 99. All right. Yeah, very excellent. good. For you, it's a very uh, special deal. Right. Very good. Uh, could you go over firing order once again? You said it doesn't go in order. Uh, well, it, it, it does go in order, but firing order is always going to be somewhat overlapping. So we got to think inside out or proximal distal. So if you can see me here, let's say I'm going to throw the shot, for instance. I love explaining this with the shot put because throwing the shot. I have the ball in my, in my hand against my neck or whatever. And so what happens sometimes you see folks, they try to throw the shot by letting the elbow drop and then trying to push the shot this way, which is close to being against the rules because the shot has to be inside your shoulder. And number two, it's inefficient because you're going to get hurt. But if we think of pushing from here, from inside the body, from, from the middle of the body, and then we ex explode and extend through the, through, the, through the chest, out the arm, through the hand, off the edge of the hand, and then off the fingers, which is where the shot is released. If you look at any pictures of a shot putter, a good shot putter, you're going to see it as the ball comes off their, off their hand. It doesn't come off the palm. It comes off the fingertips from here. So the movement's inside out, inside out. So that's proximal distal. Now, what's the firing order? Well, firing order is going to be from inside out again. We're not going to fire the chest, then the shoulder, then the arm, then the hand, then the fingers, they're going to somewhat overlap. So they're kind of moving all together at the same time. But then again, one slightly ahead of the other until we get to the final position. Same thing for sprinting, same thing for hurdling. It's, it's, it's all the same. So they kind of overlap as opposed to being here, shoulder, here, arm, here, hand, here, finger. All right, questions are popping up galore here. We got a few more minutes, so Sue Humphrey's got your back here. Uh, <laughs> Michael's, Michael's, the store has the stick figure. It's an artist tool, so if you want to go to Michael's, you can get one of those. So thank you, oh, Stuart. Man, I, you guys got me, man. You guys got me. I was going to make some money off of this. All right. Uh, I don't think it's going to be forty nine ninety nine either. So we'll have to see. Uh, all right, here's another from Coach Gray. He said, uh, "How can we understand better concentric and eccentric movement?" related to the start? Well, here's, here's, that's, I guess, more to muscle. Okay. Because I, I remember at the start, it's going to be more concentric because you aren't moving. So at that point, it's going to be, you're moving from a, from a static position. And so it's just like, um, for instance, you imagine yourself, if you had weight on your back and you lowered yourself into a half squat and you stopped. Okay. Right there. And that's going to be isometric and, and I'll be honest with you. But from here, and you begin to push yourself again, that's concentric. Eccentric is going to be when we're trying to make that muscle stretch, even though we're shortening it. So which is kind of weird in a way, because it's like, think of a rubber band. So I thought I had one here next to me, but if I pull a rubber band back while I'm pulling it, that rubber band's trying to shorten itself at the same time. And I release it, boom, that's, there goes our there goes our movement. So again, um, if you take your finger and you do one of these numbers, you can try to pop as hard as you can. That's one thing. But if I put pressure and then I pull that finger away and while I'm applying pressure and I release it, it's a lot harder, a lot faster now. So that's a little bit more eccentric because it's, it's, it's stretching. You're, there, is, there is not going to be an eccentric movement at the start, really. I mean, it, there's a little bit, but not a lot. Where the eccentric movement on the start is going to be actually be is on the rear foot because the rear foot, even though it's on the block, it is going to be slightly off. I know we teach athletes to put it on, but it, in all honesty, it's not. It's kind of on the block. And as the front pedal hits, we're pushing hard, hard, hard. That second, um, that, well, that rear foot has a higher peak velocity because it's, it's basically snapping and popping off that rear block and going forward quickly. 
while we're driving hard and fast on that on that front block. It gets to be a little more complex. I let Smitty or or or, or Fitz and those guys go into that when they do their sprint class. But um, but that's that's kind of your difference. You don't you don't really get eccentric until you start really moving and bouncing. So the first one's a little bit a little more concentric for the first few steps. And that's why squatting and, and strength training helps the first few steps of, of the um, of the sprint start. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to stop at that point and remind you that the video is available. And at the end of the video is Cameron's email, and he does respond to uh, all of uh, all of the questions. So if you'd like to at some point have a discussion with him, please feel free to email him, and he will get back to you. So uh, I'd like to thank Cameron very much, Cameron. Thank you so much. You do such a good job of explaining how to explain it better. And thank I think so that's much. the key as far as being a good coach at that point. So please uh, thank you so much for that. We'd also at this point like to thank everybody for being involved and remind you that we'll be back tomorrow night. And tomorrow night, what we'll be doing is we will have uh, sprints. It's all, it's kind of an all sprints evening, if you will. We have JT Ayers, a coach at Tribuco Hills, how to lift for speed without time or space. Uh, mass specific force. JT's relay teams are running four by four by one and 41 all the time. And then Brian Fitzgerald, probably the finest uh, sprint coach in California. He's going to do weekly sprint training programs. So if you want to go back and sign up for both those sessions tomorrow night, that would be great. So once again, thank you, Coach Gary. And we want to thank all of you for joining us. I hope you'll come back with us tomorrow night. Oh, one last thing. Doug Todd says Ikea sells those Stick figures also. So on that note, Man, you guys are we'll, ruining we'll, me here. We'll, you guys are killing me. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave there. And, and thank you, Cameron. And, and thank you, everybody. We hope to see you again tomorrow night. Thank you.